Jesus told his disciples that the world would know them by one characteristic, their love for one another. When Jesus was asked about the greatest commandment, he boiled all of the law down into two commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. So, of course, true, godly, agape love is going to be a mark of any authentic follower of Jesus Christ. Join us today as we look at this message from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. A message that tells us that authentic followers of Jesus Christ are saturated in God's love. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me this morning to the book of 1 John. We'll be in 1 John chapter 4 this morning. This is part 4 of 5 in this series where we are talking about authentic, five authentic marks of a, of a follower of Jesus Christ. The Bible's very clear that there will be those in the last day that will say, Lord, Lord, you know, and, and, and they'll think that they're going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And he'll say, I never knew you. There are people that come in the name of the Lord and yet have no relationship with the Lord. And so what we're walking through is some verses, from some specific verses from 1 John that deal with this. That give us some authentic marks or marks of an authentic follower of Jesus and kind of our theme verse, the verse that we're using, because that's why 1 John was written, John states that in 1 John 5 and 13. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And so our desire is, as we preach these messages, that if you are a follower of Jesus, if you are an authentic follower of his, that you would find these marks in your life. That the Holy Spirit would say, see, that's a mark. You're, you're, and would give you confidence that you are a believer. Karen mentioned in that video that the devil had come to her many times and, and, and said, you're not really serving him. You're not really authentic. And so this would be a way that the Holy Spirit would give us confidence that he's residing in our life and we're an authentic follower. But if you look to your life and these marks are not there, this could be the Holy Spirit convicting you that you whatever decision you made, whatever prayer you prayed or aisle you walked or baptismal waters you went through, None of those things matter if you're not an authentic follower of Jesus. We talked about being sensitive to sin. A believer's not going to cover up sin, but it's going to confess it. It's going to be open about their, about their sin. It's going to convict them. The Holy Spirit will convict a believer who is in sin. An unbeliever won't be bothered or concerned by their sin. The authentic follower of Jesus is going to be submissive to God. We're going to obey God's commands, and it will look like a life that is holy and righteous because we're obedient to him. An authentic follower of Jesus is going to be surrendered to Jesus, the real Jesus, not the Jesus we make up, uh, but the Jesus of the Bible. We're going to confess him. Uh, we confess an authentic faith in an authentic Jesus. Today, the fourth mark that we're going to look to that we find in 1 John chapter 4 is that the authentic follower of Jesus is saturated in God's love. Saturated in God's love. You know, the other day I was, uh, uh, Mark and I made a visit to Raymond in the hospital. We, Raymond and Mary Ann were there, and, um, and they were telling a story about Mary Ann's mom. And I asked them if I could share that story with you today, and they said it was okay. Mary Ann's mom was a diabetic, and they amputated her leg. She was also having like Alzheimer's and, and she, was, she was not quite herself in her mind. But she believed that that leg was still there. And Mary Ann said that you'd come in, you'd sit down on the bed beside her and she'd get up off my leg. What are you doing? Get off me. Don't sit on me. Raymond said she'd rub down there and she'd say, oh, my leg hurts. And there wasn't anything there. Mary Ann's dad, she said her mama liked to have her fingernails all painted red and pretty. And that Mary Ann's dad would... Would, would fix her fingernails and would paint those fingernails so pretty and would paint her toenails. When he would do that one toe, she'd say, hey, now don't forget the other one. And so he'd, he'd fake painting that toe that wasn't there, you know, so her mind would be at ease that she looked beautiful, you know. That leg 
wasn't there. But in her mind, it was. There are many people that think they have some sort of relationship with God. They think that they have some sort of salvation that's not there. And these marks are showing us what it means to be an authentic follower of Jesus. And today, this mark is no different. Jesus said of his people that they will know, the world will know that we are his disciples by our love for one another. That's how they will know us. Now, if you talk to any church, anywhere ever, they will tell you, oh, we're friendly. We're a friendly church. We are a loving church. Even if they're not, they'll tell you that, right? We are a loving church. We are friendly. Now, they may mean that they're friendly to each other. They may mean that they think they love each other, but that's not the case everywhere, right? Every church will tell you they are a loving church. But do you know what the world thinks about the church? This survey... Um, that I found from a uh, book, the, the Church in an Age of Crisis. Um, James Emery White cites this study from Gabe Lyons, David Kinnaman. This is how Americans, especially young Americans, view the church. 91% believe that the church is anti-homosexual, hates homosexuals. 87% believes that the, world is, that the church is judgmental. 85% believes that the church is hypocritical. 70% believe that the church is insensitive to others. Let me ask you a question. Could it be that love is the leg that the church doesn't realize it's missing? If we are supposed to be saturated in the love of God, could it be that love is the leg that we don't realize is not there? Today, we're going to read this passage, and in this short epistle, that's co- this epistle is covered in love. First John is, I mean, John himself writes about love a lot, Right? In this epistle itself, in this little, short, uh, this little short epistle of five chapters, the word love is used 51 times. This is uh, an important topic for John. This is the same John who wrote the Gospel John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, wrote Revelation. And so he, he's the, this is the John that wrote, For God so loved the world, that verse that we know and identify with, Right? It's also told in church history that John is a very old man, was living in Ephesus, and uh, Jerome talks about this, that John would ha- was so weak that he would have to be brought to the church meetings. And people would ask for John to stand up and give them a word of exhortation in the worship service. You know, John, this is uh, John, the you know, apostle who walked with Jesus, you know. And so they, he would be asked to stand and say something to the church. And, and invariably, when he was asked to do that, he would stand before the church and he would say, little children, let us love one another. That was his message over and over and over again. Let's read this passage from 1 John and see how we are to be saturated in God's love. 1 John 4 and verse 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, If God so loved us, so we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Now, as I start this message today, it's going to seem like I'm not talking about how you should be saturated in love, okay? I'm going to spend a lot of time this morning talking about God's love, But as we get to the end of the message today, I want to try to, with my last point, I want to try to make some application of that. But it's very important that I lay some groundwork before we do that. So if you will, if you will just, as I told the guys in Sunday school, if you'll just give me your brain for just a little bit and let's, let me, let me walk through some things, lay some groundwork with you. Then when we get to the third point, we'll talk about how we are to be saturated in God's love. But today what we want to do is talk about the love of God. 
First thing that I want to do in this passage is I want us to talk about God's love defined. I want us to define it to get a good grasp on what it means because 1 John 4, 8 tells us that God is love. So what does that mean? What does it mean that God is love? And what can we note about the love of God? Because if we don't lay this groundwork, there are some other verses in this text that will not make sense. If we don't look at and lay the groundwork for these things accurately now, some other verses in this text will not make sense to us unless we have a good understanding. So, God is love. What does that mean? Well, first, let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that God is loving, that God is just kind, and that God wants us to be kind to each other. That's not what this means. It doesn't mean God is love. does not mean that, that God is some kind of concept. And so the same way that we feel about love is, you know, multifaceted, that we see love as this intangible thing, this concept that's hard to define. It's not that God is that, right? God is love is not, does not equal love is God because that's what a lot of the world does, right? See, God is love. That means when you see love, you see God, but that's not necessarily so. Okay, that's how the world would define this. And if we define it that way, we're going to have some real trouble with interpreting interpreting the rest of this text. So what does it mean? One of the great things that it kind of in notion to that when the world talks about love, one of the great quotes I read this week said, love does not define God, but God defines love. Why is that? Well, because it says in this particular passage, that love is from God, and that God is love. And so in these passages, we want to understand the love of God. John Piper says this, Love is from God the way that heat is from fire, or the way that light is from the sun. Love belongs to God's nature. It's woven into who he is. It's part of what it means to be God. The sun gives light because it's light. Fire gives heat because it's heat. God is love, the source of it all. Now, many of you know that when you come across a verse like this, one of the really important things to grasp about this is the the original language of this text. Because love, in in our life, we use love for lots of things. But the Greeks had very specific words. Greek's a great language for the New Testament because it's very specific in a lot of ways. The example that I've used before is you have smell. Smell's a very generic word, but you have fragrance and you have odor. And because you're an English speaker, you know that I could say, what's that smell? Or I could say, what's that odor? What's that fragrance? And the con- those words give you a connotation that helps you understand. They're all, gen- they're all same words for smell, but they mean something a little different. And so this is so important when we go to a specific, the specific Greek words that are used. Greeks had several words for love. You probably know them. Many of you know them. But if not, I want to explain. One of their words was eros, where we get our words like erotic, right? And so eros would be romantic kind of love, this passionate love that lovers experience, right? Eros would be that kind of romantic love. It was storge. Storge was familial love. Storge is how you love your mama. You know, it's, 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 you, you, it's a love for the family. It's family love. And then there's filio, which is, which is a friendship kind of love. Like uh, the, the way I remember that is Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love, right? Because that, that starts with that filio, filio, Philadelphia. Filio is, is this, it was where that comes from. So you have this idea of brotherly love, this friendship kind of love. But the word that's used here is the word agape. And agape is, is divine love. It is unconditional, without getting anything else in return, without any ulterior motives. It is a godly love. Now, you may have heard those descriptions of Greek words before, but what you need to know is is that those words were not used equally in Greek literature. Aristotle never talks about agape. Hippocrates never talks about agape. In Greek literature, agape is a unique word. And the writers of the New Testament latched on to that word because what they, had, what they had discovered in the love of God was a love that could not be akin to any other kind of human love. This is really important that you get what I'm saying right here because it's going to help some other verses make a lot more sense in a moment. The love that God gives, he says, Jesus says, 
The, the love that I give, this peace that I give, it's not like the world gives. And the love that he gives is not like the world gives. It's in a class all its own. It is agape, di- divine love without looking for anything in return. Henry Nguyen says, the world says, yes, I'll love you if you're good looking, intelligent, wealthy. I'll love you if you have a good education, a good job, good connections. I'll love you if you produce much, sell much, buy much. The world's love is and always will be conditional. By contrast, God's love is unconditional. You understand there's nothing in you that prompts God. It doesn't prompt God to love you. He loves you primarily because he's love, right? John Ortberg says... Nothing you will ever do could make God love you more than he does right now. Not greater achievement, not greater beauty, not wider recognition, not even greater levels of spirituality or obedience. But listen, nothing you have ever done could make God love you any less. Not any sin, not any failure, not any guilt, not any regret. God loves you with this agape kind of love that is very different from the conditional love that we feel among people. Matthew Henry says that the great God not only loves us, but he loves to love us. God loves you with this agape kind of love. That is what he has poured into our heart, and it is unique, special, and different from what we experience in human love. No matter how deep that human love is, no matter how compelling it is, no matter how emotional it makes us, it is not agape love. It's a different love. Now, we should also say, this is very important to note too, that the love of God, the agape love, is not just one thing. D.A. Carson, talking about the difficult, his book, The Difficult Doctrine of God's Love, talks about that God reveals his love in Scripture You see God's love revealed, this agape love revealed in several different ways or facets. The first one would be that God has this this unique love between father and son. I have some verses, but I won't read them for time's sake, but you get the idea. There are some passages where there is a special love relationship between father and son in Scripture. There's another kind of love where God shows provisional love for all of his creation. It's just the fact that God provides what, you know, he sustains this creation. And, and, and we live in a world that, that can provide and meet our needs. It's God's provisional love. Then there's love that God has for the, the lost world. So while even though the lost person is an enemy of God and, is, and has put themselves at enmity with God, the Bible tells us that God loves the lost person. God loves sinners. The, the Bible says, the verse we quoted a while ago, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? There's this love that God has for those who even will never receive him, right? Then there's this love that God shares with the believer, which is effectual and which calls the, the believer to repentance. There's this unique love that God has where agape love is shown to those who are of the, those of the elect, those who would believe in him. And then there's another aspect of agape love, hear me very clearly here, that is relational. And this aspect of agape love, even though agape love is unconditional, there's an aspect of God's love where relationally we can damage the relationship between us and God. So a particular verse that I, that I want to read with this is John 14, verse 21. Jesus said, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And so we can agree that when we're obedient to God, when we're walking with God, there is this favor or this joy of our salvation that we experience with him, and that is damaged when we sin or when we backslide against him. That's where we don't experience the joy of our salvation because this relationship is damaged. Now, through that, God still loves you. If you're, if you know, so God still loves you in your disobedience. That part of His love is unconditional. But there's also this aspect where our actions can damage this this communication, this relationship between us and Him, and we're not able to see Him made manifest in our life in the same way. 
D.A. Carson in this book talks about how we can't focus on one of those areas over another. You can't focus on God's love for the world because if you focus only on that, you would believe, if you did, you, would, you might believe and could talk yourself into believing that every person is saved because God loves the world. But that, we know from Scripture that's not true, right? If you focus on this idea that God has this love for his elect, then for, for those who would believe in him, then you, you focus on that so heavily that you miss out on evangelism that God is calling lost people to be saved. And so an unhealthy focus on the love of God or not seeing every facet of God's love is damaging. And it's so important that we recognize that God loves, that God, this agape love is what he has called us to. Let's look secondly at the idea of God's love demonstrated. In the passage that we just read, you see it defined in the first couple of verses, but I want to focus here on the demonstration of God's love that's given to us in verses 9 and 10. Because this agape love is demonstrated to us. Love is always demonstrated in action. And this agape love is demonstrated for us in Jesus' death on the cross. Romans 5, 8 would tell us that God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ's death on the cross was the greatest demonstration of this agape love ever for those who, are, those who are lost. And when you read the passage, just look at verses 9 and 10, it tells us why he did that. It says, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us. It was demonstrated or shown to us that God sent his only son into the world to die on the cross for our sin, so that we might live through him. The end result in verse 9 is, is that we would live for him, that we would have this obedience in our life, that we would show God's love, that that agape love would be seen in us, that we would live through him, that we would have eternal life by what he has done for us. But if you look at verse 10, it tells us how that happens, how that demonstration happens. In this, it's not that we loved God, but he loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. What a big word. What a word that we never come across anywhere other than the Bible. Propitiation, what is that? When I was little, one of my first encounters with that word, I had a well-meaning person say to me that, well, you know, propitiation is like a substitute. You know, he was our propitiation. He was our substitute. He died in our place. And that's okay, especially for a child. It was a, it was a good way to maybe get into that, but it's not the full meaning of that idea. Propitiation is the idea of, 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 of um, appeasing God's wrath. Propitiation is the idea of, of um, uh, many other translations of Scripture that I was reading this week would use a phrase. They don't use propitiation, and I like that word, right? They don't use it, though. They use atoning sacrifice or sacrifice that atones, something like that. But that atonement, what's wrapped up in that is appeasing the wrath of God. As sinners, we're at enmity with God and we deserve God's wrath and punishment. But what he does on the cross is, is he is our substitute. But it's not just that he substitutes himself for us, he takes God's wrath on himself. Where it was due us, he takes it on himself and it is gone. It's removed from our life. You think about the world into which this world, this word was written. The the word into which uh, the world into which John is writing this letter. People that were worshiping, say, like the Greek gods, for example. When you read about the Greek gods and you think about, I mean, they were so capricious and fickle, and right, and they just. You could, you could make a God mad for doing nothing, and so you had to be very careful, and, and you, would, you would take a, a sacrifice to appease the gods. You would do these things to appease the wrath of these false, idolatrous gods, but you, you always walked on eggshells because you never knew when you were going to make Poseidon mad, right? What's the difference between appeasing this Greek God who is not real and appeasing the God of the Bible who is real. What's the difference? The one true God, his wrath is just. He's never capricious. He's never fickle. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word stands. His, his wrath, if the, those who have disobeyed him, those who are rebellious sinners living apart from, from God, they deserve death. 
because the wages of sin is death. This is what we deserve. Yet what Jesus has done has become our propitiation, stood in our place and took the wrath that was due us. I love this quote. This is John Stott from the cross of Christ. He says, listen, this is so good. The essence of sin is man substituting himself for God, while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. Man asserts himself against God and puts himself where only God deserves to be. God sacrifices himself for man and puts himself where only man deserves to be. You see, he died on the cross to show us his love. I believe that God loves you, and I believe that when he died on the cross, he was dying for you personally. Do you understand that? A.W. Tozer says, The love of God is one of the great realities of the universe, a pillar upon which the hope of the world rests. But it's a personal and intimate thing, too. God does not love populations. He loves people. He doesn't love masses, but men. He loves all of us with a mighty love that has no beginning and has no end. He loves you. Augustine said, God loves you as though you were the only person in the world, and he loves everyone the same way that he loves you. And he's demonstrated that for you on the cross. There's some great quotes in this week. Listen, when you look for quotes about the love of God, you come, you know, there's a lot of them, and, and they were so good, I had to put so many of them in this message. So if it seems like I'm quoting a lot of people today, I know it, but they were too good. I couldn't leave them out, right? His demonstration of love on the cross, yes, it was because he so loved the world. But he loved you. And verse 10 tells us, that he died on the cross to be the propitiation for our sins. It is the demonstration of, of love for us. And so if you think about God's love, if you're here today and you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, think about that for just a moment. Think about what it means that the God of the universe loves you. And there's nothing you can do to make him love you any more. There's nothing you can do to make him love you any less. He loves you. Not because you're, you've done something special. Not because of the, any merit within you. But because God is love. And what he gives, what he offers to us, is this agape kind of love that has no ulterior motives. It's, it's firm and it's unchanging. But he does everything possible. He does everything possible to make you see that love and respond to it. Everything has been done in Christ on the cross, in the provision that he provides, in the way that you have seen him work in the lives of others. He does all of these things. And when he reveals his love in so many different ways and we reject it, we don't go to hell because God sends us there. If, if, you're, if you're in heaven... The only person responsible for that is Jesus. And if you die and go to hell, the only person responsible for that is you. Because he calls us to obedience. He calls us to respond, and he's revealing it all around us. The love of God is defined by saying that it is agape love, but it is demonstrated through Christ on the cross. Now let's look at verses 11 and 12 in what time we have left. Let's talk a little bit about God's love displayed. When you look at the life of the believer, the, uh, the life of the authentic believer in Jesus should display agape love. I want you to notice something in this passage. We're going to focus on 11 and 12, but we also need to go back up to verses 7 and 8. Because verses 7 and 8 say that there's a difference. There are those who have been born of God and they know God. Do you see those words? That's in verse 7. They've been born of God. They've been... They've been um, born again. They have received new life in Christ, and they know God in a deep, intimate. This is like to know a person in the biblical sense. It's like a, a deep, intimate understanding and relationship. It's not just an acquaintance. And so it draws a distinction between the one who has been born of God, who knows God, who knows the love of God, and those who don't. This is how... 
all of that groundwork is helpful for us. When I was a young man and I read this verse, I had lots of questions. I mean, look at, look at, look at verses 7 and 8. Of 8. 8 is a great verse. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Well, then I started thinking about in my brain, who do I know that doesn't love? Like, do I know anybody that, that doesn't love? I mean, you think right now about the worst, low-down, scoundrel of a person that you know. They probably love something, someone. Even, even some of the most hateful people that I have ever dealt with, I have no doubt that they love their wife. I have no doubt that they love their kids. What does this verse mean? What do you mean if you don't love, you don't know God? Who is this person that doesn't love? It's not what it's saying, is it? When you think about how the world loves, the world can love very well. They can show eros. They can show filio. They can show storge. They can even show those kinds of love better than a believer can. They can even experience those kinds of love more deeply. But none of those words, none of those human words for love are what's found in this text, is it? Those who have been born of God know agape kind of love. They know God. And they know agape kind of love. It's been poured into your heart. He has demonstrated it for you on the cross. He has called you to faith in that. He has given you, opened your eyes and given you this faith to believe and to respond and he's called you to you and he's growing that in you. You have experienced agape love. But the person that doesn't know Christ, no matter how well they filio, no matter how well they storge, no matter how well they eros, they cannot know the love of God. This is why there's so much time that we spend on, on that on defining God's love because we need to differentiate between agape love and our love for our family and our love for pizza and our love for whatever, right? We use it for so many things. Warren Wiersbe says, the person who does not have this divine kind of love has never entered into a personal experiential knowledge of God. What he knows is in his head but it's never gotten to his heart. You see, those who have godly love are of God, and those who do not have godly love are not of God. And so if you think for a moment, if you are, if you are an authentic believer who has the authentic love of God in you, agape love has been given to you and shown to you, why in the world would you be so hateful and stingy and settle for eros, storge, and filio kind of love when you have access to being able to display agape love to a world who is thirsty and dying for it. They, they long for it. They want to be loved. They want to be loved that way. Why would we not show it to them? Why would, the world may believe that we stand on convictions. The world may think that we say that a thing is wrong, but the world should never doubt our love for them. Now listen, the world doesn't get to define love. The world doesn't get to define it because God is love and God defines love. And God, even though he loves, says go and sin no more. God calls to repentance even though he loves. But through all of that, you and I as believers in Jesus Christ should be showing an agape kind of love that this world has never known or never experienced. They should see it in us and the Holy Spirit can use that display of agape love to draw lost sinners to him. They can become aware of his demonstration of love and they can experience that agape love for themselves. They can, that love can be poured into their heart as well as they come to Christ. This idea that we... That, that if we love, we're never going to rebuke a person. We're never going to say that something's wrong. That's not how God loves. Our love should mimic God's love. Do you understand? You say, David, 
These people you're telling me to love, you don't know them. <laughs> David, you have never met this guy I work with. And if you're asking me to love him, listen, agape love is not something that you feel. Agape love, I mean, you can feel it, but agape love is a decision you make. You understand? It's a, it's, it's a decision you make. I am going to love that person. I am going to. That doesn't mean you condone everything that happens in their life. That doesn't mean that you're best friends and invite them over to your house to watch football. No, that, that, those, that's not the same thing. It could be those things. Could be. It could be that you invite them over to your house. It doesn't have to be. What is God calling you to do to show love to this person? Where we decide, I'm going to love them. Why? Because God has poured that love into my heart. And as we experience, as we walk with him th through life, the, the follower of Jesus should be showing this agape love to those that we, that we know may need him. Something that I like in this verse is that there's an aspect of God's love that is going to happen to you. Um, when I first started writing this out, here's what I put. In my notes, I wrote something to the effect of, um, part, God's love is, give, is um, give, you're able to show God's love immediately. In one sense, you're able to show God's love immediately as you become a Christian. And in another sense, you have to learn it. But I changed that word. I don't think it's immediate. I think it is inevitable is maybe a better word. A, a believer in Jesus Christ, when they are saved, will inevitably learn to love people with agape love. Okay. But, it, but for those of you that say, well, David, I don't do a very good job at this. I may not be a believer. Learning to love with agape love is part of our sanctification, and it's in this verse. Look at where you find it. Verse 7 says, verse 7 says, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. That says that if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the capacity to love with agape love, and, and you will grow in that as you grow in Christ. But look at verse 11. I like this. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. He didn't say, beloved, if God so loved us, we will or we shall or we ought to. Which means it's, it's what we should do, but we may not always display it as a believer in Christ Jesus. But that's part of our sanctification. That's how he's growing us. The, the, the one who doesn't know Christ, the only thing that they can resort to is to filio, eros, storge. All they can resort to is human love. And they may experience in, it in, in a deep and meaningful way, but never in agape love. And what we've been called to do is to manifest it. Do you see in verse? Well, it talked about him, not verse 9. In this, God's love would be made manifest among us. You see that? But then it also tells us in verse 12 that no one has ever seen God. So I want to try to connect those two thoughts, right? When, when we love the lost, um, it's a way that they are able to see God. You see, um, God's love, agape love promotes church unity and the Holy Spirit can use it. It's the right thing to do. But what verses 11 and 12 told me is, is that we ought to love people with this agape love because what it will do is it will make him manifest to the world. I want to show you a verse. This is in uh, John, uh, the gospel of John, John 1 in verse 18. It says this, no one has ever seen God. Notice how the language is very similar. The only God who is at the Father's side. But he has, Jesus has by coming, has made him known, has made God known, has made him manifest. That word in the original language, in the original, in the original Greek language is exogeomai. And I'm telling you that not to impress you. I want you to hear how the word sounds. Exogeomai. It's where we get our English word exegesis or to exegete. Uh, the only place I ever hear that in the world is in preaching. But you know how I'll read the text 
and then we have this process where I'm kind of explaining what is in the text, that explanation or interpretation of what's there is people would say that I'm exegeting the text. It's the exegesis of the text. And what I'm doing is, is I'm, I'm uh, making known what's there. It, at our first reading, it might be unclear. At a first reading, we've just skimmed through it as I've read it. And, and you have not read this verse throughout the week like I have, where I've looked at individual words and thought about individual phrases. And so through the exegesis of the sermon, I'm taking things that I have noticed or observed or seen in the text, and I'm explaining it further. I'm making it manifest so that in, in the time that we have, Hopefully you will have a, an understanding of this verse as I feel like I have gained it this week and the Holy Spirit has shown things to me this week. I can explain what the Holy Spirit has shown to me. It will have a deeper meaning to you, right? Think about what that is. What that in 1 John says, when it says that we manifest, that Jesus came and he exegeted God. Jesus came and he exogeomai. He, he revealed God. He put God on display for the world to see. Now think about how that language is very similar to what you see in our text today in verse 12 where it says no one has ever seen God but if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected, completed, made manifest, exegeted, exogeomide to the world. It is on display for the world to see. God is there for the world to see in us and the world should never doubt that. They should never doubt our love for the Lord and our love for each other. That's why Jesus said that by this, the world will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And I will tell you, I'll say again, I believe the world is hungry and longing for that kind of love to be displayed to them. The title of today's message is that the believer in Jesus Christ should be saturated in God's love. And I want to take a moment, I have these, this over here that I just want to close with, just this little simple illustration. When you drop a sponge into this bowl of water, this sponge is saturated. It is saturated. Water can't help but fall out of the sponge. Do you see that? If I set this sponge, if I were to bring you up here and I were to set this sponge in your hand, it would get your hand wet. If I just set it on your hand, it would make your hand wet because it is saturated in water. This sponge is soft and pliable. It's useful. I could take this sponge and I could wash dishes or I could clean around corners and edges in my bathroom. I could clean with this sponge because it is useful and pliable. Now, these other sponges that I have up here, these sponges have, have been wet, but you see they're not useful, are they? Outside of that water, they are hard and brittle, and they bend a little bit, but not with the same kind of pliable. It's not like this sponge. These are not useful. They're not useful because they're not saturated. What he's called you to be is saturated in God's love. As an authentic follower of Jesus, you should be, you should be when you go to work tomorrow, you should be dripping the love of God. When you're around this world, you should be getting them wet with the love of God because you love them. You, it, it can't help. You know what else? Look at what happens here. When I take the sponge and I just press on it a little bit, water comes out. You know what happens to the authentic believer who's saturated in God's love? When you experience a hard thing in life and you go through and, and life pr presses on you and pressure happens, do you know what will happen in your life? They won't help but be able to see God's love. It's not an easy thing, what Karen talked about in that video this morning. The fact that Allison died and passed away and is a parent dealing with all that, I can't imagine any of that. But what she said is God was real to us, and in that moment of pressure, God grew us, and God has used that moment to be able to help others in that moment because the love of God does that. The love of God does that. This is what our lives should be saturated in the love of God. And if not, devoid of God's love, it will be this. This morning as we close, I want you to consider which sponge you identify with the most. Hard, brittle, calloused, not able to be used for ministry and evangelism. 
or saturated in the love of God that spills out onto a world around you. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, as you consider which sponge represents you, as you consider where you stand with him, consider the message that we've looked at today. Have you experienced that agape kind of love? Not that you chose God, but that God chose you. Not that you love God, but because he first loved you. Do you recognize his, his demonstration of love? Have you put your faith and trust in the Jesus who died on the cross for our sins and rose from the grave to give us eternal life so that we might live through him? Have you experienced that agape love? Has it been poured into your heart? Because if you're here this morning and you're wrestling with that, that's the biggest decision you need to make this morning is to give your life to Christ. But as we come to the idea of an authentic follower of Jesus displaying the love of God, maybe you recognize that somewhere along the way you, you've got a leg missing. You didn't realize it. But you have not been love. You have not been agape love to the world where God has placed you. Your life is not saturated and dripping on to the lost people around you. When the pressures of life come, you break and it's tough. by being saturated in the love of God that when the pressure comes that you would react in the power of the spirit rather than the power of the flesh I don't know where you stand with him but this is what I know God loves you God loves you do you love him and if you do is it evidenced by your life Lord, this morning we are so very grateful for your love for us. Lord, we pray this morning for those of us in the room that know you, that Lord, we would just begin to pray right now for those who do not. Lord, I pray that they would experience your conviction, that they would respond to you before this time is completed. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see and appreciate your love in a new way today. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.